field has moved, more transradial interventions are being done, and one of the reasons has been, it's the, for the patient point of view, very ease. Uh, patient likes it, comfortable, patient requested, demanded, one trial showed that if you had a both radial and femoral, next procedure, what would you like? And 70% said uh, they'll go back radial, and about 20% said femoral. So majority of them uh, will be the radial is a clearly uh, preferred approach. But does it make sense uh, in terms of the complications? So this is basically the seven trials of uh, about 10,000 plus cases, difference in mortality and major bleeding. You see a 10,000 for the transradial, 10 for the transfemoral, and there is a 0.5% lower mortality, which is significant in favor of transradial intervention, and more sicker the patient, anemic, stronger antiplated therapy you're giving, more is the benefit of the radial intervention, uh, and so, and more important is, it's mostly driven by lower vascular complication and lower bleeding. Because clearly with the radial, less complications occur. And this leads to the better outcome of these patients. Individual data shown here. And uh, it has come to our guidelines. It's a class one indication now. Uh, one, to decrease mortality, uh, as well as the vascular complication in STEMI patients. And even stable patient to decrease the vascular complication. So it's a class one indication uh, now as per the latest guidelines. The second is uh, UK BCIS, which is British Cardiovascular Society, CHIP. CHIP, we call it complex high-risk interventional procedures. CHIP basically is complex cases. So they came up with a score, uh, which was the, came out in Jack intervention, and they presented the data of the 30 days. The based on seven patient factors and six procedural factors, as you see here, uh, age 80, female sex, prior stroke, MI, PAD, EF, uh, low, and CKD, or procedural factor of the left main PCI, three-vessel PCI, dual arterial access, LV mechanical support device like uh, impella or balloon pump, legion length more than 60, and rotablation. So taken these together, you can put a coil, assign your patient in one particular risk group. And what is the advantage of this is you can see in-house um, MECI, which is the major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular event goes up when more of these risk factors are present. And which we did, so you divide them, no risk, low risk, intermediate, and high risk. This was 30 data. Then what we did is from our database, which has a tremendous number of patients, who said, why don't we apply to our international patient and give the one year outcome? Not just 30, 30 days, one year. And this is basically what our paper of the 20,000, you see the patients, same, and you see at each level, uh, from a score 1, uh, 0, 1 to 2, uh, 3 to 4, uh, 2 to 3, 3 to 5, and more than 5, there is a 28%, almost 30% increase in one year bad outcome, and it is for all. Whether it's a death, MI, Stroke, maybe not that much, but repeat revascularization and bleeding. So it should, seems to be a simple test. So you say, well, <coughs> excuse me, what does it matter? I said, matters here. Somebody who has a risk of 10, we know that we could bleed, have more MI, that patient not going home. You need to strategize your resources. Patient will be admitted. So therefore, you can take care of those patients appropriately. So this was very good, uh, came out from our database. Now, the new technology is coming after a long time, which is the drug-coated balloon. I'm sure you are aware of drug-coated balloon in the peripheral arteries, right? Has been there for 10 years. There was some controversy, some higher mortality. But now for the coronaries, has been available out of United States for last seven, eight years. But finally, it has come to America. Four companies have the trials of the drug-coated balloon here. And we actually, uh, of one of the trial, um, uh, the a solution uh, is the serolumus. Uh, we did the first uh, drug-coated balloon case in the United States about uh, three months ago. But there is a lot of data have come now comparing drug-coated balloon with drug eluting stents. So now basically, how does it work? So there is no stent, only the balloon, and have a special uh, proprietary technology that the drug is attached to it. When you inflate, it goes into the vessel wall. 
and then you inflate for 60 to 90 second and it patient with the ISR, that's where the most of the data are, but even with the native vessel, and I'll show you the data, that basically the drug, without leaving any metal, it works quite well. Two drugs, Peclitaxel and Cerulumus, and how does it work better? Because since you're not putting a stent, you have no additional metal, no polymer, less inflammation, less side branch closure, and short depth. You don't have to give uh, your depth therapy for a long time. So this leads to a better outcome. And now we actually have a trial of the basket small, three-year data they were just shown, and basically showed that in diabetic patient, we're using the drug-coated balloon against drug eluting stent, DS, uh, DCB versus DES, significantly reduction TVR. Although MACE was not different, but clearly non-diabetic was not different, but diabetic patient. So diabetic patient is small arteries, better using the drug-coated balloon once available. Now, it's not available yet because it's in the trial. Now, another point which I emphasize here, that if you're planning to drug-coated balloon and now it didn't work and you have to put a DES at the same time, your event rate goes up. So what we also learned that you have to prepare the lesion before you do a drug-coated balloon and it has to be good. If not, then don't put the drug-coated balloon, put a DES. Because if you do both, Drug-coated balloon and DES, your outcomes are bad. So same, similar, you know, principle we have in intravascular brachytherapy for recurrent uh, DS restenosis. There, the studies have shown, if you do a brachytherapy and you put a stent for some region, they have higher event rate at follow-up. We are actually now, we are about like 750. We started brachytherapy in uh, 2012, uh, about say, they do between 60 and 90 per month over 650 or 700 cases, we have zero stenting at the time of brachytherapy. So same is that you need to be careful. And uh, the other data basically was uh, multi-vessel coronary artery disease, the same way the drug-coated balloon uh, that requiring the stent is less and your event rate is lower, as shown here. Uh, another, there is a trial called Picolito, which is the vessel of less than 2.75, a three-year outcome, again, uh, lower myocardial infarction of the DCB and lower MACE rate and no thrombosis. Why? Because there's no additional stent. So super uh, data. Though there is also data in STEMI patients, no difference. So cases where you think cannot get antiplatelet therapy for whatever reason, don't to put a DS, put a drug-coated balloon and works quite well. So this basically is the working um, diagram that how you do is lesion preparation, uh, dilate, pre-dilate, high pressure, rot ablation, whatever you need to do, optimize. Once it looks good, sometimes you may decide based on the imaging that there is no dissection, then you put a drug-coated balloon. If it does not look good, then you put a stent. If you do not want to do drug-coated balloon and the DES. Now, just to say, we are now the highest enroller in this uh, the trial, Mad Alliance trial of 17 cases. One case happened same. We could not open the lesion completely and we did not use a drug-coated balloon. Because there we know if you put a drug-coated balloon and you put another stent, it will be trouble. So of the one case out of 17, so maybe five to seven, six percent of cases will happen where you would not be able to use drug-coated balloon because lesion did not open up well and you had to go to the DES. Now, imaging, uh, basically looking inside the artery is a, a tremendous lot of data which has come in last few years, and I'm going to share uh, various fact, various uh, imaging, uh, the data and uh, the types. This is our angiography. This is our IVAS, everybody knows. OCT, which can tell you about the thickness of the uh, fibro fibrous cap thickness, and the NEARS, which is the infrared spectroscopy to see the yellow plaque into the coronary artery. And then we also came with the IFR and FFR measurement, knowing that it's less than 0.8 or FFR or 0.89 uh, IFR, they do better with the PCI and more than that, if they're higher, you defer the PCI and don't put the stents. So this field has gone quite a bit. There was a latest trial from Korea, Renovate Complex PCI, published in any JM. The 2000 patient, uh, imaging guided PCI, 1500 versus angiographic PCI, 75% uh, were uh, IVAS, 25% were uh, and in the OCT, and the outcomes were good. 
So outcome work, as you can, you can see here, the target vessel failure, TLR, all significantly lower in the imaging guided PCI group. Now, a nice review. So basically, the ACC Intervention Council recommended that more and more uh, cases should be done with the intravascular imaging at the operator level, institutional level, national level, just to support. Uh, and uh, the, we know the data, basically, that imaging helps to improve the patient's outcome. And this is pre-interventional, lesion preparation, post-intervention. Last data we have from our ACC NCDR, which is the, our registry, 18% PCI in US were being done with the imaging. Now that number seems to be about 25, 26%, but I cannot say for sure. But, uh, and it's a three-fourth uh, IVAS and one-fourth uh, is your uh, OCT. Now, therefore, a lot of uh, push going on at this time that we make mandatory. Many of the question comes, do you do it in 100% of cases or, or be selective? Uh, that uh, actually the issue remains. Uh, the, our guidelines is still uh, remain in terms of the 2A uh, for using imaging, but they are going to change because these were the guidelines of early last year. So question comes, should you use it in every patient? And I think that if you make it selective in about uh, one third of the cases with the complex, you get the most benefit. And biggest benefit occurs when you do it in the end the final, because you optimize your results. So then, there was a trial call. Uh, now, we have both are good, FFR and uh, IVAS. So question is, which one is better? So in intermediate lesion, this trial flavor looked into the aspect that should you do a PCI based on FFR or based on IVAS, and they have the clear, clear cut criteria, uh, which case FFR clearly less than 0.8, um, and I was and have a two-year outcome and basically showed a two-year results are identical. So FFR or I was guided PCI with identical individual endpoints are shown here. And now there are three other trials will come in next one year. Define GPS, Illumin 4 with the OCT guided and optimal randomized clin clinical trial on the I was will really put us uh, on the map imaging and making it a type, I would say, uh, class one indication soon. Now, we are very proud of uh, my associate, Dr. Anpurna Kini, which Beth showed many of the apps she has developed, that presented the late-baking clinical trial, originated from a single center. You know, usually late-baking clinical trials are the multi-center or international, but in ACC, and came from the excellent work with the clearly, as a, the credibility by the yellow one and yellow two, and idea was by giving the PCSK9 inhibitor, evolve map uh, and do uh, every week, uh, I mean every two weeks, 140 milligram for 26 weeks. So one, you do a baseline, then bring the patient back and do the imaging, showed clearly by giving this medicine, which everybody knows, it really brings down the cholesterol. Look at this, from 100 goes down to 40. And no effect on uh, HDL or kind of very little or uh, sens high sensitive CRP. But what happened is, the goal was, do you make a cap thick, your fibrous cap thickness? Why? The thin cap ruptures. If you make it thick, more stable. So this is what we found. Minimal fibrous cap thickness increased by 26.8 millimeter, and uh, from 48, who were the thin cap, became 13 only, but 20% patient didn't respond, despite their cholesterol went down quite a bit. And same thing in the yellow, that uh, LCBI, uh, basically, uh, lipid core burden index decreased from 306 to 213, and also in about 24%, lipid core did not decrease. So basically, it says that no matter what agent you could do, so why it is, some genetic region, so that is what the second part of the trial, and those are being analyzed, and we expect to present the data in the European uh, Society of Cardiology in late uh, August, uh, and uh, being looked into at this present time. This is the classical case, uh, that baseline, uh, OCT thickness increased. This is the, your yellow plaque disappeared. Although uh, Dr. Keeney point the, you know, coined the term, the melting, the you know, melting fat sign. So this gone away uh, at follow-up, as you can see here. Now, 
we are also working on the microvasculature. So key is one, besides the PCI, remember a lot of patients keep coming back with chest pain. Coronage are normal. So what it is, maybe it's microvascular. Now we actually have a test, the wire spatial catheter, you can test for microvasculature. Uh, and this is, gives you a CFR, and uh, the does it help in the PCI? Uh, looked into it in addition to FFR, whether CFR, which takes care of the microvasculature, and idea show, the study showed that if you have one or other, it's in the middle, so it doesn't help. So CFR, microvasculature, for, in addition to FFR, has no additional value, but FFR, it is there. Then, post-PCI, patient have a PCI, did good, what was the usual practice? No symptom, one year we used to stress test. Routine practice. But without any clear cut data, they always have a guideline only 2B recommendation, even after cabbage. So what this, this group of people said, what if with a complex patient, we do the stress test versus regular follow-up. Regular follow-up means patient coming to you. If you decide because of chest pain, you're doing it, stress test or cath. If otherwise, not necessary. But other group, they did the stress test every year for two years. And guess what? No difference in any endpoint of the cause. MI, death, unstable angina, you see it here, identical. Now, if you do stress test, you did more cath, and of course, little more repeat revascularization. But this turns out to be that many times our concept, what we have, unless you put to the trial, you cannot come. You, keep, you know, they're like anecdote. But trial really makes it, yes or no. It means that routine stress testing is not necessary. You say, well, maybe. Diabetic patients who don't have symptoms, look at the diabetic patients, even diabetic, no difference. So not necessary, clinically driven stress test is completely fine. Then, bivalutin used to be in quite a bit in the, our earlier trials. And now, uh, then, happen came up with the heat PCI many, but now there's a new trial of BRIGHT4, where they gave bivalutin with the infusion another three hours, because in the past, there used to be a higher early stent thrombosis, but if you get infusion, that disappears. So this is what compared against heparin from China, uh, 87 sites, uh, and uh, they looked into this aspect of uh, giving bivalutin with the additional uh, three hour of infusion, and what they found, bivalutin better uh, compared to heparin, event rate 1.3% lower. More importantly, all cause death, bleeding, reinfarct, and more important, earlier, we used to have a little high thrombosis on bivalutin, disappear. You say, why? Because now you're giving three hours of infusion. We changed this policy back in 2009. They're coming up with the same data. So therefore, you infusion, there's no high stent thrombosis. Then, the idea has shown that you have multivessel disease and your STEMI and non-STEMI, you should have complete revascularization. Culprit and non-culprit vessel. So idea is, if you do, when do you do it? Same time or you stage it? And this was a part of this biovesc study prospect to randomized trial uh, that 764 patients got the immediate complete revascularization. 764 got the stage within six weeks. Average time was about three and a half weeks. And they brought the patient, uh, the 53% four, the were non-STEMI, 37% uh, were STEMI. And you see here, that immediate complete revascularization in the blue had a lower event rate, largely because of lower MI and lower uh, unplanned revascularization. So basically means many of these patients while waiting for the second stage PCI come back. So key, you do it, same time, same hospital admission may not be at the same time, maybe one or two days later and so. So this is the latest one. So complete revascularization, multivessel disease, STEMI, non-STEMI, better to do it at the same time and you don't need to wait for subsequently. Then the left main. The left main is a, you know, always used to be uh, in the past. Uh, cabbage, but then many trials have shown like Excel, very good data up to five years, but there was higher mortality in the PCI group, even in the moderately complex left main disease. And now we have many uh, pooled analysis uh, showing four randomized trials of the Syntax, Precombat, Novel, and Excel, 4,400 patient, uh, 20 syntax go 25, 5 to 10 year follow up showing that you do have some penalty of PCI, but it's very small, 0.2% per year. So in five years, 1%, 10 year, 2%. But yes, you have higher MI and revascularization, and of course, you have a lower stroke rate. 
So those are the ad advantage, disadvantages. So basically, mortality is not different in the PCI versus cabbage group. And only thing is, once you have more complex disease, higher syntax score, better was the cabbage. So this we knew, more complex cases should go for cabbage. Then the same group, say, is there a difference in acute and uh, stable syndrome? Acute syndrome always have higher event rate versus no acute syndrome. And uh, overall basically showed that ACS or no ACS, that if you have the difference in the PCI or cabbage is the same, that higher MI and revascularization, but other difference was not there. So key is acute coronary syndrome will have high event rate, but not much difference what we knew in the overall uh, meta-analysis of the cabbage versus PCI. Now, you have the left main, you do PCI. What should be the technique? Two stent or one? There was a DK crush, which was a big study, which showed that two stents better than one. And uh, this another group did uh, EBC main, the basically showed two stent, stepwise provisional or systemic dual was slightly better in terms of the stepwise provisional, which is the blue, but not significant. So overall, we still believe the distal left main bifurcation should get two stent approach. Then FFR and IFR trials, the FAME 3 frame and defined flare. Now FAME 3 trial was the trial of FFR guided PCI multivessel against cabbage. Left main was not included, and this patient happened that cabbage did better, 10.6 versus 6.9, and individual endpoints were here. Lower death, uh, MI, stroke was, of course, uh, slightly higher, and revascularization, uh, again, lower in the cabbage group. So key is, FFR-guided PCI, this multivessel disease, didn't do better than cabbage, and we are a little surprised, but this were the data. But we also knew within there, if you have low syntax score, PCI did better than cabbage. So came back to the same thing. Once you have complex disease, high syntax score, cabbage is better than PCI, whether you do it with FFR or without FFR. Now, but we always want to get a positive offer, negative trial. So what we found, that patients who got the PCI returned to work full time was much better. And of course, uh, with the overall, uh, the quality of life work was a little better with the PCI compared to cabbage. But overall endpoints were not different. Now we have the three-year data seems to be the difference is catching up, the becoming less and less. Uh, P-value was 0 0.02 at one year, now three years becomes uh, only 0 0.07. Then the patient again, that multivessel disease, do you do an angiographic guided PCI or FFR guided PCI in acute MI patient? If less than 0.8, you do PCI, more than 0.8, you leave it. And angiographic, you do anybody lesion more than 50% and found that FFR guided PCI has a lower event rate compared to angiographic guided PCI. Each part in blue versus red lower uh, in terms of the FFR guided PCI. And these were the now those who know there are two tests available for MA, for physiological testing FFR and IFR. The initial data were defined flare and sweetheart uh, showed that at one year outcomes were similar whether you do FFR or IFR. Now we have the five year data of the defined flare, which compare FFR versus IFR in stable CAD. And guess what? There is a lower mortality in the FFR guided PCI, MACE trend towards the lower, and then all the, all those no difference in revascularization MI, but lower mortality. Question is, actually Sinai, we use only IFR in about 15, 20%. We are basically FFR dependent. Maybe a lot of people will change based on this. But I think uh, IFR, both are equal but in the short term, but long term, first time we have this data that lower mortality, and we still don't un understand why there should be a different mortality, because your MI and revascularization is not different. So this is unexplained, but we ha still have to have the paper, uh, because this was only abstract. The most important advance of uh, last year was a trial which really kind of shaken up our concept. The concept is the patient PCI done in patient with the LV dysfunction, revived BCIS2 trial, and basically we know that trials have been done with the surgery, with the low ejection fraction, showed benefit after five years or 10 years only against medical therapy, but this trial basically looked into the patient with low ejection fraction, viable myocardium by various testing, then randomized to PCI versus medical therapy. Now, if you think about this was, we have been teaching everyone this, that if you're viable myocardium, your LV dysfunction, PCI is the best thing to do, better. 
should be better than medical therapy, and they followed this patient for almost five years, and basically data were disappointingly negative, no benefit, surprise, shocked, all community that how could that be? But this is where the data are. These are the individual endpoints showing here, except that unplanned revascularization in medical therapy is higher, but that's of course, you had lesion, you left, they require PCI, but no de difference in death uh, and uh, MI or re recurrent hospitalization. Now, we always try to find, as I said, positive in the negative trial, that your spontaneous MI was lower in the PCI group compared to medical therapy group. Again, softer, just like ischemia trial. But overall, no difference and very, very shocked about it. Now, you say, well, maybe it will be some benefit by improving the ejection fraction. And look at that, even EF did not change. They are a little better quality of life, but EF did not change. So very surprised, I was shocked and uh, or disheartened by this data, but that is what, when you do the trial, it tells you exactly, not a guess game, that what exactly happens. So this is the best, I would say, uh, these are the top 10 uh, advances. Now I want to put it together because I gave a lot of data that what you should uh, take home uh, in brief, and we call it a central illustration. You know. Uh, each journal now, Dr. Fuster started when he became Jack editor, that whatever the paper is, put the sense of paper in one page, and he called central illustration. So that's what I'm going to do here. What did we learn? PCI and LV dysfunction and ischemia, big disappointment, two thumbs down. FFR guided PCI versus cabbage, our FAME, FAME 3, IFR versus FFR at five years, uh, our defined flare, one thumb down. PCI versus cabbage and unprotected left main, drug-coated balloon in di diabetic small vessel STEMI, uh, the CHIP score, thumbs up, all good. Imaging-guided PCI, PCSK inhibitor to increase cap thickness, FFR-guided PCI in MI with a framing, two thumbs up. And really, the transradial PCI, immediate complete revascularization, and bivalent STEMI is three thumbs up. That really puts it together how our practice changes in interventional cardiology to become the better intervention list and improve the patient survival. Now, do we do it? Let me tell you that we adopt these policies. They keep changing in our protocol in the cath lab. So these are our data, the latest one, uh, which Beth eluded with the safest and highest volume. You can see here, uh, double star mean, you're statistically lower than the statewide average. And uh, Dr. Keeney got in both the categories, uh, award the double star, nobody else got in the New York state. So clearly we have been consistently in last 25 plus years since two, 1994, the data are coming that we have two star in one or two categories. Uh, say, well, it looks good. This is the New York state. Well, that was a 30 day risk adjusted mortality, but other points, acute occlusion, cabbage, stent thrombosis, all lower significantly with lower vascular injury as shown our latest data with the New York state. You say, well, the state is good. But what about the America, rest of the USA? Well, we had the ACC and CDR. We Mount Sinai data against ACC and CDR. Um, the, as you can see here, Kathy is, you know, fills up all the New York State data and uh, rest comes out from the database. Uh, the overall lower mortality, we actually in hospital death to STEMI transfer largely because of the STEMI cathode, which showed risk adjusted mortality, length of stay significantly lower Mount Sinai compared to ACC and CDR. Superb. Just to say, we still, uh, the goal mission had been teaching, teaching, teaching. We do, you are good, but really you then give service to a small group. But what if you can be global? And that's the concept I started in 2009. First time, teaching from Sinai, one hour live relay for coronary, then we added peripheral, uh, and then we added uh, endovascular, uh, endovascular, then structural. The idea is the teach more what we do. So people can follow and also do the same service what we are doing, great service to the humanity with a better outcome. And this actually has been a great hit. Almost 30,000 hits per month. Per month in 173 countries. You can see here, but top are India and USA. We are both on the YouTube and CCC Live. Now, one hour is done. You want to go further. It's to teaching what if you want to, you wake up at one o'clock for some reason, you got a bad dream, now you want to see one case. What if I give you a 24 hour live channel on that day? That's a MedStream 360. We started, this is the 10th week now, one, the, one day for the time being, 
24 hours. You anytime. So what we did, you see various centers, global, China, India, UK, uh, Australia, uh, Canada, America. So 24 hour cycle. So people are doing PCI in their own time. But for other, it will be in the different zone. But full 24 hour teaching. Done nine weeks in a row. And again, th this concept, when I started the CCC live, I didn't have much funding in the beginning because nobody said, what are you talking about? Even this is still, this took us about 1 million to get off, uh, to start this uh, pilot project of three months. We could get only $350,000 from the industry, $650,000 I paid from my philanthropy. But why? Because believe in the concept, we need to educate, educate, go further, and go global. With that note, I'll stop here, and thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so good point. So if somebody who has a high creatinine uh, and the CKD, which we call, that what is the biggest risk for them? They develop acute kidney injury and kidney gets shut down and require dialysis. So these patients require extra, uh, extra monitoring. First is, if any nephrotoxic drugs you have to take off. Most common is uh, ACE inhibitors and of course very many others, but you take off. Second, you give a hydration. There are many trials have been done. Only thing that helps is the hydration. So you make sure many times LV dysfunction. You cannot give too much fluid. But what we say usually to the patients, drink a lot of water at home, night before, one or two liter. Then they come, we give hydration. One milli, it's a one ml per kilogram, at least three hours before, and then you continue post. The mucomist, we give it. I think it's a more of a placebo, but it makes patient feel good. So whether it works or not, but we give it still. So, but the idea there is, and then you do a very small amount of contrast. That is the key. Biggest thing is hydration and as little as creatinine, uh, the contrast possible. So many times we have done the PCI in the 2022 cc's of diet. Yesterday, one of the case was done. Total occlusion with the 24 cc's of diet. Total occlusion of the LED, the kidney did. We actually have patient with a creatinine of 3.6. We'll not worry about uh, the patient being the cath, because we know how to take care of it, and they will not develop the dialysis. But this is a very, very important topic, and still continues to evolve, uh, because one of the big factor has been now. In the past, creatinine was not the, you know, ACC, NCDR, sorry, the NCDR. They actually give, uh, with the, have few parameters, each institution. They give an extra payment from the Medicare and the Blue Cross Blue Shield, it's based on your door to balloon time, uh, that how many patients have a stress testing, appropriate, what's your complication, what's your bleeding. Now they have added acute kidney injury, creatinine more than 0.5. So they will have a cutoff, they still make, they added just now, and they will understand what will be the number. But we think it will be about 7%. So if you are less than 7%, you get extra payment back to the institution. You have higher, you penalized. So this is where the creatinine has become so important now that you need to measure and have to treat those patients uh, properly, just like having somebody uh, post-procedure MI. Okay, all right, that's, thank you, thank you.